Part 1. Loss Chapter 1. August 1928 Four and a half hours before her life would change forever, Minka stood in a dusty parking lot, twisting her handkerchief as she willed her family to hurry up. If they took much longer, she might just pick up her ankle-length skirts and run all the way home. Her stepfather, Hunnis, leaned against the black side of the family's milk truck, blocking out the white D in Sunnyside Dairy, his hands jammed into the pockets of his summer suit. It was not yet noon, but the air was already thick and hot. Around them, engines loosely clattered as men cranked up Model Ts. Women called out goodbyes to one another and gathered children before climbing inside their cars. Minka's sister Jane and their mother were still on the circular brick steps of Zion Lutheran Church visiting with friends. On any other Sunday, Minka might have lingered too, joining in conversations if she felt bold enough, speaking whichever language was being used, English, German, or Dutch. The church community, largely made up of immigrants, had finally voted ten months earlier to conduct all services and business meetings in English. But once they were outside, people's native tongues were loosed. Today, Minka had fidgeted through the entire service. She couldn't wait to get back home. Minka de Young was sixteen years old, taller than average and as thin and straight as a stalk of wheat. Her fine brown hair was cut in a loose bob and pinned back on one side with a frilly ribbon. Her gaze was lively and intelligent, though she often ducked her head bashfully and, like other people who fought shyness, had a habit of holding herself very still in public. Minka knew her nose and ears were too large for her face. She didn't realize her delicate cheekbones were beautiful. She was always careful not to draw attention to her hands, which had been damaged long ago. Hannes removed his fedora, but rather than fan his face with it, he held it in both hands and squinted at the pale sky, watching a thrush flap its way to the top of the church's steeple. Minka glanced toward the church. Her mother had moved to the bottom of the steps, but Jane was still deep in conversation, leaning close to her friend Jet and smiling about something. Minka wished they'd hurry. This afternoon was the event she'd been waiting for and thinking about for weeks, her sewing-class picnic at Scatterwood Lake. Back home, a new dress waited on a hanger, freshly pressed. She would put on just the right jewelry and redo her hair, and then, for a few hours at least, she'd be like a normal teenaged girl not a full-time worker who split her time between the family dairy and a meatpacking plant. But Minka couldn't do a thing until her mother and Jane hurried up. One row over, a car rolled by, carrying a banker from First National. Its paint was an exquisite dark blue, shiny enough to reflect trees. Minka's eyes followed it. She loved beautiful things even if they weren't hers. Hannes nodded to the banker behind the wheel. The man returned the gesture. That is one of the new Fords called Model A, Hannes said to Minka. Are they better than the Tin Lizzies? Minka asked. She usually managed to contain all the questions that popped into her head when adults were talking. She'd been raised with perfect manners, after all. But excitement about the picnic loosened her propriety with her stepfather. They are supposed to have a ride. Not so bumpy. They are fast. But also der expensive, I think. Think came out sounding like sink. Like Minka's mother Jenny, who'd sailed to America just months before Minka was born, Hannes had emigrated from Holland. He would speak with a thick Dutch accent all his life. They watched the car turn onto J Street and disappear. So many things had changed in the decades since the Great War ended. There was still a hitching post on the other side of the church building, 
and some farmers came to church by horse and buggy. Minka remembered when that was the only transportation anyone had. A few years back, she and her siblings had gone to a picture show for the first time. As they watched people and scenery move silently across the white cloth screen, her mouth had dropped open and stayed that way until her tongue dried out and she'd had to swallow painfully. Jane and John, always quick to tease their sister, hadn't so much as nudged her. They, too, had been staring, goggle-eyed. Every month seemed to bring a new innovation. Most homes in Aberdeen, South Dakota, now boasted electric lights indoors, and a few had a newfangled mechanical box for cold food storage, an improvement over root cellars, so long as the toxic chemicals used for cooling didn't spill onto human skin. There were radios in living rooms and skirt hems that ended more than twelve daring inches above the ground. Hannes's house had an indoor bathroom, a luxury to which Minka and her family had quickly and gratefully grown accustomed. Before moving in with him, they'd lived for twelve years at Uncle's farm on the prairie, where Jenny worked as housekeeper and conditions were more primitive. Three years ago, when Uncle retired, Hannes van der Zee came calling, and shortly thereafter, with no announcement or fanfare, Jenny had gotten married. The marriage gave Jenny's children a permanent home, but it upended the only life they'd known. Hannes was starting up a new dairy and needed strong workers, and he believed that high school was for city kids who have nothing else to do. When each de young child reached the age of fourteen, he or she was put to work milking cows full time. Minka's older brother, John, soon escaped to the Navy. In the parking lot, Hannes cleared his throat. It will be a hot day. He looked at his hat, eased it through his hands. Hotter than yesterday, maybe. Yes, sir. Minka lifted her arms away from her body. She didn't want to start sweating in her church dress. During the sermon, the sanctuary had rippled with a sea of paper fans, and Minka had kept shifting on the hard wooden bench, thinking of her new dress, the waiting lake, the hours of freedom in front of her. She couldn't resist bringing it up. Maybe it'll be cooler by the lake this afternoon, at the picnic. Ja. Maybe. Minka didn't know that her mother had convinced him to let her go. Hannes hadn't married until he was nearly thirty-five years old, and young women were a mystery to him. Raised in Europe, he had absorbed the austere attitudes of a different century regarding children, work, and rewards. From his perspective, duty trumped pleasure and there was plenty to be done at the farm every single day. Any time away created more work that needed making up. Sometimes on warm Saturday evenings after milking chores, Hannes would lean through the kitchen doorway and say in his quiet way, Come, go for a drive. Since bedtime came early at the dairy, there wasn't time to freshen up or change out of work overalls. Minka and Jane climbed into the stuffy back of the milk truck, and Hannes drove them and Jenny to the ice cream shop in town. After buying one malted shake in a tin canister and requesting four paper straws, Hannes brought it to the truck and passed the shake around. When they'd each had an equal number of sips and the last bit of ice cream was gone, Hannes returned the canister and drove home. To him, such an impractical treat, likely more than he'd gotten as a boy, was enough. As clusters of the congregation moved toward vehicles, Minka spotted girls from her sewing group. She watched the friends wave to one another before climbing into their cars. Across the parking lot, Minka overheard a girl named Dorothy call out to a friend, Clara. We will get you in an hour! Dorothy slammed the door to the already rumbling Model T. 
Minka clenched her fists and blew air into her cheeks. Her eyes jumped to Mom and Jane, who had yet to move, and then up to Hunnis, still leaning contentedly against the side of the milk truck. He usually didn't allow dawdling. Despite Reverend Crowshar's sermons about the Sabbath, there was work to do every day of the week. But Hunnis merely glanced at Minka deflating the hope that he'd wave her mother and sister away from the church steps. Though every day of her life was consumed with heavy labor, work had never bothered Minka. Her bony frame masked a surprising stamina. Often the longer she worked, the more invigorated she felt. She knew that her natural gifts were physical, and she was proud of them. Maybe she couldn't light up a room just by walking into it like Jane, but she could work as long and accomplish as much as anyone she knew, including adults. It was the loss of her education that scraped at Minka's spirit. She'd been raised poor, but with self-respect. Even as a child, running barefoot in the summer dirt at a farm that wasn't her family's own, She'd carried herself with a sense of dignity, had felt as worthy and capable as any other girl. Now, at sixteen, Minka felt ashamed. What if milking cows was all she was good for? What if an uneducated milkmaid was all people would ever see when they looked at her? This afternoon's picnic would allow her to once again feel as good as. Her heart pounded, partly from nerves, partly from excitement. Perhaps if her mother and Hunnis saw that today's outing didn't affect her work, she'd occasionally be allowed to go on future adventures. Finally, here came Jane across the field. Her arm was linked through her mother's, and she leaned against her, giggling about something. Jenny was smiling. In this pressing heat, they moved slowly. Minka wanted to drag them forward. She turned and opened the truck's back door. Its metal handle was hot to the touch, and the hinges squealed. As she climbed up, she banged her knee on the wooden crates that served as seats, and her handkerchief fluttered onto the metal floor. She'd been twisting the cloth so anxiously that it looked like a wrung-out chicken's neck.